This is Greg Orloff with IIoT World, and I'm here today with John Burton. John is the CEO of Ursaleo, which is a technology company in the digital twin space. So welcome, John. Hey, Greg. How are you? Doing well. Doing very well. So thank you for joining us today. Um, John, you, you've navigated through several startups and, and exits, and uh, successfully, I might add, as well, through your career. And I'm, I'm curious, you know, what, what's catalyzed you now to go back, back in 2017 and inform Ursaleo? Yeah, so I, I sold the company in 2011 to a Japanese group, and I then got the job with them of running the Americas. So uh, a lot of travel to Brazil, a lot of travel all over the US, uh, a lot of travel to Japan. And I'm, I'm just, I, I prefer the startup world, the small company world. Um, so I did it for six years. And then I, you know, six years in, I was kind of, I don't know, I, I, I want to do something more interesting again. I want to do something that make, makes a bit more of a difference rather than just being a corporate uh, corporate guy. So yeah, around about the end of 2016, decided that I wanted to get back into to starting another company. Oh, fantastic. So, so tell us a little bit about Ursa Leo. What, what's going on? What are you folks up to in the digital twin space? Sure. So we, um, it was myself and a, a friend of mine who worked at Apple for 10 years. Uh, we got together at the, the end of 2016. And we said, you know, we literally sat around the kitchen table and tried to decide what, you know, where, where we wanted to go. I knew IoT was going to be part of it. Um, I'd, I'd done a lot of work on the hardware side of IoT. And we then eventually came up with like, you know, the, the biggest issue we saw with companies was handling the data. They're generating loads of data. Um, but really acting on that data and, and making sense of it all seemed to be the area. And Angie, with her Apple background, you know, very, very UI focused, user interface focused. Okay. Um, so that, that was the catalyst was really, okay, how can we take you know, huge quantities of industrial data and, and make sense of it? Um, and hence using digital twins to, to help do that was, was kind of the direction we ended up going in. So there's, I know there's several multiple players out there in the digital twin space. So maybe just frame for us what, well, conceptually, what were you after? What were you trying to accomplish that wasn't being done out there right now? With yeah, so digital twins, are, unfortunately, it's become a buzzword. So it's a bit of a broad term. At one end of the spectrum, you've got basically a database that reflects numbers that are you know, reflecting the real world. Um, at the other end of the spectrum, you've got you know, general electric simulating jet engines. And both of those things are called digital twins. We're mm -hmm. somewhere in the middle. Um, Really, the, the, the sort of difference that we've we've chosen is we use gaming engine technology to render the twin. So we're, we're doing photorealistic 3D models. Um, but those models are rendered on a gaming engine, which means they'll run on anything. They'll run on a laptop, they'll run on an iPad, probably run on your phone if you really wanted them to. Um, so that made them suitable for using for real-time monitoring, real-time applications. And I think that's the big difference. You know, there are, there are companies out there doing CAD-based digital twins, but those are very, very heavyweight. I was, I was talking to Siemens earlier this week, and they were like, yeah, you know, $100,000 worth of hardware. And, <laughs> and XYZ's company's uh, digital twin will run nicely, but that's not realistic for broad applications and broad deployment and deployment in the field, you know, on site. You got it. So, so you got a platform, and you're leveraging some of those technical lessons from, from Apple and the gaming community, too. Exactly. So yeah. to you, then, what's the, what specifically is it about this that appeals to the industrial world? Um, so it, it's a, it, the main use for our stuff is real-time monitoring, real-time, you know, you've got real data coming in. Traditionally, that's been looked at on a dashboard, um, you know, mm -hmm. to, 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 you know, usual dials and graphs and, and lines. Um, there's limitations there. But the big limitations are, you know, 10, 12 data points on a screen. Um, when something happens, you've got a abstract. V, uh, user interface which you've now got to relate to the real world um, so the fact that we could run this on anything we could run it in real time um, we could give it to maintenance staff going into the factory floor that that meant that we could provide a much nicer user interface that could deal with 5,000 cents of data coming in and, and still give them something that they could look at and immediately knew what it meant oh you know this this electric motor is overheated and it was clear because the electric motor is flashing and the sensor value is above it um, they, you know, the, um, with some other things we can get into, but um, that that was really the big difference. Is it's it's not CAD software that requires a mainframe to run. Um, it's not just a database of numbers. It's something very visually visually appealing um, that you know you can go and look at on an iPad whilst you're walking around the factory floor. Got it. So that's some standout details then. So you announced earlier, or you're about to announce, I think, that you've got four 
new online models that are going to be accessible to mm -hmm. demonstrate the, the 3D aspect of the digital twin offering yep. that you've got. Now you're, you're looking at energy, I think commercial buildings and probably a couple other sectors. Uh, do you have a demo you could just maybe pull up and, and walk us through a little bit? Sure. So I'm going to sh um, share my screen. Okay. It's going to be it's going to be the other screen. Uh, let's just make sure I got the right one up. Why can't I swap over? Okay. So you should should be able to see a, a screen now. Yep. Okay. Got it. Here. Cool. Okay. So this is um, this is one of our um, one of our models. So as you said, we're actually pushing out five models um, on our website next week. So these will be uh, available um, on the website for you to look at, and then you'll also be able to buy off the self sensors and connect the sensors directly to the model. So the idea there is, you know, we want to show people this stuff actually works and that you can connect, um, connect a, you know, a simple off the shelf sensor directly to, 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 uh, to what we've got. So the one I'm showing you now is obviously the oil and gas, so kind of at the energy one. Um, this would be the okay. typical viewpoint you start in. So here we are, we're sort of in bird's eye view, looking down at the model. Um, I can then shift down into street level view. Uh, and I'm actually looking at a sensor right now. So the viewpoint is changing slowly. Um, but if you can see, there's a, a temperature sensor there. And it's reading 33.16 Celsius. That's actually live data. That's coming off one of our test sensors. Uh, you can see it's just changed to 33.18. So we've set up these uh, predefined viewpoints. Um, I'll move to another one. So now we're looking at uh, a light sensor. I'll go to one more. Now we're looking at, uh, I think it's an air quality sensor. So these are these are real sensors that we've, we've connected. And as you can see, they're kind of located on the 3D model. So if I create an alert, uh, the camera automatically moves around um, to the alerting sensor. Oh, so it holds uh, right in on the, in the yeah. environment. So the idea is um, for an operator, you know, looking at a factory floor with, with a thousand sensors, something happens, they're immediately taken to the location, you know, where it happened. Um, I can click on that sensor. So more information comes up. So this could be just information about the sensor, it could be data sheets, could be maintenance records. So again, now they've, you know, the operator not only knows exactly where the, the alert happened, they're able to immediately access any records associated with that piece of equipment or that sensor. Um, so then they can dispatch maintenance. Um, they can go and deal with it. So then they clear the alert. Um, and then they'll be able to immediately upload uh, documentation from the factory floor through an iPad interface on the 3D model. So a little bit different to it's the way things have been done today, where you know the, the control room has a view of what's going on. The factory floor probably doesn't very much. Um, the view from the control room is kind of two-dimensional dashboard. Now we've got something that's very contextual um, and shows you exactly you know where things are happening. We can also walk around just for fun if you want to. You can you can uh, move around the model as well. Um, might not come over too well on the video call because it's a, the frame rate. A little bit of delay, but no, I, I see what you're talking about. Yeah. So you've got you've got full control <laughs> over manipulation of that model. So, so the model yeah. becomes your dashboard. Then you're literally exactly. you can, got it. So you're not looking at just a data feed with. Christmas tree or a traffic light type of an indicator here that's taking you right to the issue. Yeah. Um, so that's the, the basics um, is, you know, here's a, here's a real time view of your operation. It's a lot more intuitive to look at than the, the sort of, you know, normal dashboards. From there, we're doing all sorts of stuff. So um, just got off the phone with a customer. They want to see fluid flows in a gas facility. They want to see the direction of electrical currents in, in some of their equipment because a common mistake is things are wired up incorrectly. Um, collaboration, collaboration modes, um, exploded engineering views. So we've got a list of things that we want to, to use to uh, enhance this. But it, it's getting great reactions from the industrial account base um, who have been struggling with user interface, struggling with training, struggling with operators just not understanding the interface they're looking at. Um, and it's one quote we've had from a customer you know, recently is, this is going to save us about 15% of our operational cost. Time, time, accuracy of records, um, reporting. So it seems to have a lot of good applications. And in terms of, in the truest sense of IoT, interoperability, I mean, you're, are you going through an app right now or are you just logged in through a, a URL to get at this? If, if an operator had a, an iPad or an iPhone or mm -hmm. Android? 
Yeah, so we deliver it through web browser, which is the way okay. you typically look at it on a PC, especially if you wanted to you know, combine it with other, other things you're looking at. Um, we can deliver it as a native app on, a, on an iPad. We can deliver it as a native app on a, on a PC. The actual model you're looking at is sitting in the cloud, though. So the, the 3D piece of this is cloud-based, which is what enables the collaboration. Um, a guy sitting in Detroit looking at this would be seeing the same thing. It would see the same camera views as I moved around. Um, so that's that's a very different way of doing things uh, than typical where you're loading the model on your local computer. We're, we're delivering, the, delivering these models in real time over the network. So how about, in, let's talk about interoperability a little bit then, you know, in terms of interfacing with you know, other IoT platforms, products, technology. What can you talk to from that standpoint? Yeah, so most of the customers we deal with already have an IoT platform. They're already gathering data. Mm -hmm. um, so we take data usually in for, as an API. Um, so far, we've taken it from AWS, Azure. We're working on Siemens in the near future. So some of the standard IoT platforms. Um, as long as the data is available through an API, we, you know, we can, that data can come from anywhere. And, and we're not, you know, we're very complementary to other IoT platforms. We're not trying to compete with them. Um, so, yeah, we, we do a lot of what we're doing right now is, is interoper interoperability, you know, building bridges. Got it. So in terms of, you know, I guess, target clients, I mean, are you, are you targeting organizations that are looking to begin a digitalization journey? You know, are you going after larger organizations? You mentioned price point a little bit in the beginning of some of the other investment levels that uh, traditional approaches take for digital twin. Um, so we didn't really pick one market or another, but the, the, the guys who've contacted us are generally on the larger side. Um, you know, I mentioned Siemens. Um, yeah, I've got other large customers. I, I probably can't really mention their name. But yeah, the, the usual engagement is, you know, we're looking at an enterprise level software deployment probably the customer's going to be spending, you know, half a million dollars to a million dollars a year on this. So it's, it's typically organizations are already spending significant money on IT on, and on IoT. So it sounds like you're, you're well on your way. I mean, Ursula is uh, moving forward, but I also know what the role of CEO entails in terms of planning mm -hmm. for the, the unknown, the unforeseen circumstances, you know, those, those things that are lurking in the shadows, so to speak. So is there anything that's keeping you up at night right now? A uh, lot less than there used to be. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. That's good. <laughs> so yeah, my sleep my sleep has improved quite a bit over the last two years. Um, you know, I, I keep looking around for competitors. Um, we, we, we're obviously not the only guys who could do this. I think we've built a pretty unique team with you know a mixture of Apple Apple guys and game designer guys, uh, and it's very Silicon Valley. So I, I do some, <clears throat> sometimes wonder if the big guys are going to come after us. You know. Siemens resources, Bosch's resources, but talking to Siemens, they 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 freely admit this isn't their area. You know, they're they're industrial software guys. They're, they're not focused on user interface. Um, so that that would be one area. If I had to, you know, really worry about it, I keep convincing myself. I come across a new company, I'm like, oh my god, they they've already done this, and then I dig in, and they haven't. Uh, I, and I talked to Gartner the other day, and that they don't know anyone else doing what we're doing exactly. So I, I'm fairly confident we're out. The first guys out there really doing this exact application of digital twins. Um, scalability, you know, we're going to have to hire a lot of people real fast. Um, being able to bring them on, make keep the team cohesive, um, you know, make sure everyone's being you is integrated and, and developing in the right way. It's entirely possible to grow too fast and, and screw up an engineering team, especially as a result. That's probably one of our bigger challenges right now. Yeah, so cultural adaptation in a, in a fast growth track is, is a tricky, <laughs> a tricky ledge to manipulate. But yes, sounds like you're well on the way. So, then talk to me a little bit about looking forward. Where are the next steps for Ursuleo in 2021 and beyond? Um, so, products got to be developed further. I mentioned customers; they start using it and then they come back and go, "Okay, we'd love to see fluid flow. We'd love to see." volumetric heat maps, we'd love to see, you know, electrical current directions. Um, so a lot of the, the front-end UI guys are working on those advanced visualizations uh, and how do you show fluid flow in a way that's useful to the, to the customer and, and, you know, looks good and gives them the information they want. So that, there's a big challenge there, and that'll be, that'll be ongoing, but certainly through 2021. Uh, building integrations with a lot of different IoT platforms, you know, driven by customer need, basically. Um, 
as I say, a lot of the big big ones we, we've done already or some of the big ones we've done already, but there, there's hundreds of these things out there. And then sales expansion into Europe and Japan. We have some customers in Europe, um, but we need some resources there to, to handle them at the moment. They're, they're getting supported out of the US. And going back to my old company in Japan with a really you know, cool product and, and getting that market opened up, I think that, that'll probably keep us busy through 21. It sounds like it. <laughs> Well, I, I appreciate the insight. Thank you for sharing with us in, in the community. So look forward to hearing good things in the future. Yeah, no, really appreciate the, uh, the time. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Chad.